pay if you choose not to. Uh, we've got two presenters today uh, from the Freedom of Religion South Africa. Uh, Nadine Bedenholst and uh, Michael Swain will be talking to us about a topic say speak no hate. Uh, they will be giving us their legal view uh, or a legal view on the hate and free speech in South Africa that we, we know, particularly for us in the media space as to how is it going to affect us and what does it mean to us in the media space. But perhaps before I let them to speak to us, allow me to introduce them to you and introduce the organization that they come from, Freedom of Religion South Africa, uh, affectionately known as FOSA to many people. FOSA is a legal advocacy organization mandated to protect as well as to promote the religious freedom rights for all South Africans, regardless of their specific religious and ideological beliefs. And we have with us this afternoon, Naden and Michael. And Naden is a founder and member of FOSA and the advocate of the High Court of South Africa. She serves as the full-time legal counsel for FOSA and has represented religious freedom rights in multiple court cases. Naden is also a popular speaker and has spoken on religious freedom issues on various international and local platforms. Nadine was awarded a scholarship to study an LLM degree in international human rights law at the University of Essex in the UK. During her studies, she also held an internship uh, at the United Nations Secretariat. Uh, Naden, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. We also have Michael. Michael was raised in England and obtained an honors degree in law before immigrating to South Africa. He has been a successful businessman having founded and run companies in diverse areas, including software development, events management, as well as marketing and communications. He also spent over 30 years in Christian ministry. Michael is an accomplished public speaker and serves as the primary spokesperson for FOSA. I want you to welcome them this afternoon as they are joining us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can also pose your questions on our chat box. I will make sure that I, I keep on checking the chat box, then I'll pass those questions to them once they are done. They will be sharing the stage between themselves. And uh, let us welcome Michael and Naden. Over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Sipu. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try and share this screen. Uh, I hope that uh, it's going to work successfully. Tell me, um, have I succeeded? I'm not seeing anything yet. Uh, probably uh, still coming my way. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Right. It's coming. Yep. You can put it on the slideshow now. Wonderful. Is that now visible? Yep, 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the Association of Christian Media for the opportunity that you've given us. We really are so blessed by the work that you do, by so many media outlets that I know are present here that we often have regular interactions with. And please know that uh, we, 4SA, Freedom of Religion South Africa, we want to disseminate as much information as we can uh, to you so that we can get out the very real threats that we are facing to our freedom of religion rights. And let me just start off by giving you a little background as to what uh, we do for us. Hey, we are a nonprofit legal advocacy group. Uh, that means, as Pastor Sipu said, that we are faith neutral. We defend the rights of all faiths uh, to believe and to speak and to teach and to live out without interference or punishment from the state or anyone else, their faith in this country. That's what our constitution grants us in terms of section 15 specifically. Now, we were established in, in, in uh, 2014, uh, following basically an ambush. And it's one of the interesting situations that we're going to be addressing a little bit later in this talk. Uh, a atheist couple 
in the, in the neighborhood of a local church, so the Joshua Generation Church, downloaded a manual on uh, parenting, cherry-picked the uh, spare the rod, spoil the child scriptures out of it, reported the church to the South African Human Rights Commission, basically for promoting and teaching child abuse, and bang, a lawsuit followed uh, on the heels of that. Again, what we find in these cases, and we'll reinforce this later on, is that activists often use these uh, chapter nine institutions of the state to basically fight their cases for them with our taxpayer money. And those who are under attack basically have to pay for their own costs and their own defense. But that was why we began. And so um, advocate Nadine Badenhorst was a member of that church and the uh, senior pastor of the church and the apostle of the movement, uh, Andrew Selly, uh, teamed up and resisted this. And not only did they resist it on their behalf, but they quickly found out that freedom of religion is actually under broad-based attack. And it's not just a local South African agenda. In fact, we're probably quite late in the day when we see the impacts hitting our shores. It is something which has been pushed significantly internationally. In most Western countries, uh, they are, there is a lot less freedom of religion rights uh, left than we still enjoy here. And that is why we exist to vigorously protect and promote our religious freedom rights. And we do this uh, before government when it comes to draft legislation and policies. We uh, make submissions on them. We engage with government departments. We uh, go to parliamentary committees. Uh, we meet with and, and present before chapter nine institutions, particularly uh, the CRL Rights Commission, that's the Cultural, Religious and Linguistic Rights Commission, that's the chapter nine institution that specifically has a mandate to uh, look over uh, the religious freedom of this country, among other things. And also we go to court. So we present uh, court cases. We either are a principal member where we are the primary party involved in a case, or alternatively, we give legal advice in some cases, or we will join a case as what is known as an amicus curiae or a friend of the court, specifically to make sure that religious freedom rights are properly and well represented. Because that is an area where, by the grace of God, and over the last um, probably, gosh, now seven years, uh, we have gained a considerable amount of experience and expertise. So let, let me get right into this um, presentation. And let's look at the current laws which govern our free speech. But I think it's true to say that, generally speaking, free speech is under attack. It's not just under attack through government legislation. There is almost a subliminal type of censorship taking place. We used to live in a society where it was, you know, kind of live and let live. Uh, the old saying, you know, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Those days have long gone. Now it is much more to the case of, you know, say say what we want you to say or at least agree with us and if not necessarily not just agree with us but we want to now make you say what we want you to say what we believe is right and this type of erosion on free speech is becoming increasingly serious but let's not get ahead of ourselves because uh, advocate nadine is going to be looking at the papuda amendment bill which is the latest a piece of draft legis legislation that's going to form uh, a significant portion of our talk. But under the current laws, so section nine of our constitution, the constitution sets the framework. It is, if you like, the lens or the framework within which all other laws must exist and which kind of vets um, or is almost like the lens through which all other laws are viewed to see whether or not they actually pass constitutional muster, as they say. And the big section here when it comes to uh, speech is obviously equality. Section 9, the equality. There must be no unfair discrimination. This would include actions, not just speech, uh, on the prohibited grounds. And then they list a number of grounds, sex, gender, sexual orientation, including conscience, religion, belief, and a few others. And this is, I think everybody would agree, fair, but it's given teeth and it is further interpreted by what is known as Papuda or the Equality Act. Uh, that, 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 it, that is the promotion of, of, of equality and the protection against unfair discrimination act. And specifically, section 10 defines what hate speech consists of and uh, 
also uh, the unfair discrimination and the remedies that it concerns are pretty broad based and we'll get a little bit more to that. Then of course, section 10, human dignity. You have a right, not only in the constitution, but there is also the common law crime of crime and injuria, where you may say or do something that is so egregious to somebody's human dignity that it actually amounts to a criminal act uh, or uh, such a severe infringement of their dignity or privacy that it actually will literally land you, land you in jail or with a significant fine. And recent examples of that, of course, we saw in the Penny Momberg and uh, uh, Penny Sparrow rather, and, and Vicky Momberg cases, uh, which obviously involved uh, racism. And more recently, and perhaps more concerningly, uh, in, in two cases which really revolve around religious freedom, which I'll cover at the end, uh, which is the Chetty case and the Joseph case. So section uh, 15 of the Constitution, that is the one which primarily and specifically protects religious freedom rights. It is freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, and opinion, broadly known as religious freedom. And that is, of course, a basket of human rights. Section 31 also guarantees people's rights to practice their religion and to form association. So freedom of religion is actually this basket of thought, expression, belief, opinion, association, um, affiliation. That is something which is protected by our constitution. And again, given further, um, if you like, expression uh, and, and, and freedom, when you read a section 16, which is freedom of speech. But very importantly, as in the Constitution, a very narrow definition of what the Constitution would say is restricted speech or what we would call hate speech. There's a good reason why hate speech should be defined very narrowly. And the primary reason for that is that the, the more broadly you define hate speech, the less free speech that actually remains. And so therefore the constitution, we believe very appropriately, gives a very narrow definition of hate speech. And this is the test. There is obviously, it cannot be speech which includes propaganda for war, we'd all understand that. Uh, an imminent incitement, uh, incitement to imminent violence, we would understand that. But here's really where the test is generally speaking applied to, let's call it everyday speech. It prohibits speech which is an advocacy to hatred that constitutes an incitement to cause harm, specifically more the violent type of harm. So uh, a, an example of that, which you would probably know would be the uh, struggle song, you know, kill the farmer, kill the boar. That is hate speech. Who do we want you to hate? Farmers. We, we want you to hate them. What do we want you to do to them? Kill them. Classic hate speech. The problem is that as mentioned, the section nine of the constitution was further, if you like, expanded upon and given teeth by the uh, so-called Equality Act, known as Papuda, which was passed in 2000. And the problem here is that it starts to broaden uh, what amounts to unfair discrimination. There is a general prohibition on unfair discrimination by the state or anyone else. And it has a quite an interesting test, which means that it's very, very easy to be caught by it. The first question is, has there been discrimination? In other words, you know, can you show that you were treated differently from the way somebody else was treated or that you should have been treated differently, uh, but you weren't? In other words, were you deprived of some benefit, some opportunity, um, or th that would have been generally available to somebody else? Once you've established that you have if you like experienced unfair discrimination, then the person who you're accusing of that, the burden then shifts to them to prove that that discrimination was fair because it is deemed in a sense, once you've proven that you've been discriminated against, it is deemed to be unfair in the absence of a counter argument which demonstrates that it is fair. And that uh, test, if you like, also takes into account a number of factors, some 14 factors, as to why it might or might not be, be fair. The big problem with the Papuda Act, of course, is the hate speech clause, which is in section 10. And what this clause has done is it has actually expanded the definition of hate speech from the Constitution's definition. It defines hate speech as speech which could reasonably be construed 
to demonstrate a clear intention to be hurtful, harmful, or to incite harm, or to promote or propagate hatred. Now, the problem with that, as will be immediately apparent, is that whereas in the constitutional court, you have a very objective test, did it actually advocate hatred against that group? And was the impact of that or the desired effect of that to incite harm against them? When you start using terms like reasonably be construed to do something which is hurtful or harmful, what exactly do you mean by that? You see, the problem is that, of course, that becomes highly subjective. And that is why the Equality Act, uh, we believe, is a very uh, seriously defective piece of law when it comes to protecting and promoting religious freedom rights. And certainly many of the cases that we have been engaged with have come under this Equality Act. Now, when it comes to filing a case, and we'll just touch this briefly, uh, some of these cases, as have been mentioned in the initial case of the uh, Joshua Generation case, uh, were initiated by complaints to a Chapter 9 institution, uh, typically the Human Rights Commission, the, the Commission for Gender Equality, or the Serial Rights Commission. And it takes place in the Equality Court, which could be a high court and can also, interestingly enough, be a magistrate's court. And this is one of the problems we find is that the magistrate's court being a lower level court, often the standard of, 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 of the judiciary in those courts is obviously not necessarily familiar with these very perhaps nuanced areas of law. And the outcome, of course, of the, the penalties typically will be, if you're found uh, to be in breach of the act, will be some form of apology, or some form of interdict in order to do something or to not to do something. And, and here's where the problem also comes in. Uh, it can also be in the form of a fine. And the court has wide powers in terms of what it can or cannot allocate. And fines are I think arguably the biggest threat because when you punish people financially, you can literally destroy their livelihood in the process. Now, the, the, you would think the good news for the media community is the fact that this Equality Act, when it comes to um, unfair discrimination, there is, uh, if you like, a defense clause. Uh, you cannot unfairly discriminate in the act, not just the hate speech, but in terms of Section 10, uh, unfair discrimination is the prohibition on disseminating or broadcasting any information and or publishing or displaying an advertisement or notice that could be construed or understood uh, to demonstrate a clear intention to unfairly discriminate against any person. But the out clause, if you like, the protection clause, the media exemption clause, is that it specifically protects bona fide fair and accurate reporting in the public interest. Now, you think that would be a good thing, but the problem is that often it looks beyond that when it gets to the case, because the question is, was it fair? And of course, fair is, again, a very subjective viewpoint. And one of the cases which is really uh, probably going to be a leading case in defining the definition of hate speech in the Equality Act, and a lot of other things are now pending upon this, is the so-called Kulani case. If you don't know the facts of the Kulani case, very briefly, uh, John Kulani was a journalist. He published an article saying, call me names, but gay is not okay. And he made some pretty horrible and derogatory remarks about homosexual people. And yet he did not specifically advocate hatred against them and nor did he advocate violence against that. But he did say some pretty reprehensible things. There is no doubt about that. Nobody's arguing that. And that was found to be hate speech by the High Court in August 2017 in terms of the definition of the Equality Act. John Kulani uh, appealed the case. And this has been a long-standing case. It's literally gone on for about 10 years now. And in the Supreme Court of Appeal, which we thought was a very, very good judgment, the Supreme Court of Appeal looked at this broad definition, which involved harmful, hurtful, and they thought this was not, and they ruled that this was not in keeping, and it was broader than, and therefore unconstitutional, than the constitutional definition of hate speech contained in section 16. And that was a very positive outcome. But again, that has now been appealed. And in fact, what they did was they ordered 
uh, Parliament to basically amend the definition to bring it in line with the constitutional definition. That then went on appeal and it is currently and has been heard by, it was heard in September last year by the Constitutional Court. And we are awaiting the judgment, which will probably be the landmark judgment on the application or the extension or the extent perhaps of hate speech in this country. To give you an idea, the, the South African Constitutional and uh, Supreme Court rather of appeal has made certain statements which give us hope that the broader definition of hate speech will in fact be struck down by the Constitutional Court and will in fact end up therefore being back to the uh, Constitutional Court's narrow, more objective definition. In the Kulani case, they quoted George Orwell and they said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. That's exactly right. If we start to make hate speech anything that people find offensive or just disturbing or what have you, then what we're effectively doing is we are eliminating the opportunity for the robust debate, which is actually an integral and essential part of any democratic society. Another case also pending before Concord, the Supreme Court of Appeal again said that the fact that a particular expression may be hurtful of people's feelings or wounding, distasteful, politically inflammatory or downright offensive, does not exclude it from protection. In other words, the Constitution does not give you the right not to be offended. And again, in a, another case, in the Moyo case, it says no one is entitled to be insulated from opinions and ideas that they do not like, even if those ideas are expressed in ways that place them in fear. So the Supreme Court of Appeal is taking a very broad view. Now, one of the cases that we're involved with, and again, this is a very pertinent case, is a, a, called the Chetty case. And in this case, uh, Chetty, who was an evangelist, made statements along the lines of while he was conducting an outdoor meeting that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. Now, the South African Hindu Dharma Sabha, uh, plus two other uh, local Hindu organizations, filed cases against him. The one case was filed against him was, again, a criminal case for crime and injuria. They said that this amounted to religious defamation, to Hindu bashing, and they also filed it under uh, the Equality Act. Here's some of the things that they're asking, that he ceases preaching. Uh, he will not make those claims again. He does 200 hours of community service and pays 200,000 rand fine in damages, as well as giving it a public apology. But again, we need to understand that the Constitutional Court has already ruled that even if a belief is bizarre, illogical, or irrational, you have the right to declare your belief publicly and openly to practice it without being afraid of prosecution or persecution. Even if uh, people don't agree with that, that remains your right. So let's look at one other case, the Boloftobos case, which actually involves um, a, a wedding venue who very graciously uh, said that they were unable to help a same-sex couple to celebrate uh, on their property. They set up their wedding venue to celebrate what they believe to be Christian views of marriage. They do not discriminate against anybody. They've had plenty of LGBT people on their property before. They welcome them warmly and, and widely, but they do believe that they should not have to celebrate or to participate in every form of event. So, for example, they won't um, allow, say, Halloween events, or they won't allow um, trance parties and that type of thing to take place. But one of the things which is interesting, and I just picked this up purely on the hate speech, because we start to see how speech, what you say, particularly if you are uh, of a religious persuasion, Christian specifically, starts to come under fire. In a separate case, the South African Human Rights Commission launched the case against Beloftobos, and the same-sex couple also launched a case against them. And one of the things that the uh, same-sex couple are asking for is that uh, for a declaration the that the expression of religious beliefs as the basis upon which to refuse to associate with or conduct business with a same-sex couple constitutes hate speech and discrimination in terms of the Equality Act. And they're also asking for two million rands worth of damages for the pain and suffering that they were caused when they were uh, their application was defined. And interestingly, here's a statement they made in their case. Had the respondents kept the beliefs to themselves then there would be no dispute in this matter. In other words, the trend is 
that you can believe what you want. You can think what you want. You can pray what you like. But if you step out of your front door, then you better keep quiet or you're in trouble. So this has held up uh, the Kulani case, specifically the Constitutional Court's definition, has held up what was also formally coming down the pipe, which was the Prevention of Hate Crimes and Hate Speech Bill, which again gave a broad definition of hate speech, and it made it for the first time a criminal offence, which was subject to a three-year for a first offence, 10-year for a second offence, jail period, and or a limitless fine. There was, again, Nadine can cover this perhaps a little bit later, thanks to a major pushback by the religious community, there was included in the next draft a religious exemption clause. And so we're very happy with that. It is an indication that it is something which if we do push back hard against these things, we can get a better result. Uh, so let me just end with one final picture. This must not be the shape of things to come. This was in Bristol. The person being held by the police is a street preacher. He simply made the statement that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When his case was heard in the magistrate's court, the, the prosecution argued, which was the crown, which was the state, that in 21st century Britain, any such statement quoting the Bible will automatically amount to hate speech as the public order offense. And the magistrate agreed and fined this man find him, gave him a 30,000 rand fine, which thankfully was overturned on appeal. We don't want to get there. We need to push back. We need to protect and promote our religious freedom rights. They are under threat. And I now want to hand over to Advocate Nadine to take us for the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Hello, everybody. It's so lovely to see some familiar faces on the screen. I trust you've had a fantastic conference so far. Um, I'm just going to screen share from my side as well. All right. On the current slide. As, uh, all right. So what I'll be dealing with in this session is um, certain amendments that are being proposed to the Equality Act. Now, what Michael has dealt with is um, basically the provisions that protect both religious freedom and free speech in the Constitution. And then he's also dived into the Papuda, Papuda Act or the Equality Act, the current act. Now, importantly regarding that act, it's specifically written into Papuda that Papuda is second only to the constitution and that if Papuda had to be in conflict with any other act of parliament that is passed, then Papuda has to prevail. Now, that is very important because as you can see already in terms of the current provisions of the act, that act is really used as a club in the hand of um, anti-religion activists, particularly also LGBT activists, to come at the church or to come at religious institutions or even religious individuals who say things that they don't like, that they find offensive, um, that they want to be struck down. And so when we look at the amendments that are being proposed, we will see how, just how broad it is. And that a bill or, or rather an act which is already very dangerous and which is already being used as a, as a weapon to, to, to club the church and to club religious believe, uh, believers with, now has the potential to do so even to a much greater extent and therefore is really overbroad, we would submit unconstitutional and really draconian um, in what it proposes. So firstly, I want to say this bill was recently published by the Department of Justice so it's not yet before Parliament. Um, after it's been approved in its finalized form by the Department of Justice, it will then make its way to Parliament. So there's quite a process ahead still, but it is very important nonetheless that at every stage of the proceedings, we make submissions. Um, Michael's referred to the Hate Crimes and Hate Speech Bill, which um, for the first time would have made hate speech a crime. Now in that bill, Parliament um, at one of the almost last stages before it came to a standstill with the Quilani case, Parliament received in excess of 60, 660,000 submissions and many of those came from religious persons, religious organizations and it's really as a result of that major pushback from the public that Parliament wrote in a religious exemption clause. And so this bill I want to say if not to the same extent, well, yeah, probably even to a much greater extent, has 
uh, the potential to threaten and to erode our religious freedom rights. And therefore, from the outset, I want to make it very clear that every organization, and this is where you as the media organizations can play a massive role in assisting us to mobilize the public, to mobilize religious organizations, to mobilize religious believers, to put in their submissions so that we can push back on this bill, which will be extremely, extremely dangerous for our um, religious rights. Now, let's then look at what the bill does. And I'm really going to mention um, just some of the lowlights. Uh, there are a number of problematic aspects with what is being proposed, but I'll just mention some of the, you know, as I said, the most important aspects and particularly how it would apply to you as media organizations. Now, what does the amendment, amendment bill do? Well, really three things in main. Firstly, it broadens the current definition of equality and unfair discrimination in the Act. Secondly, it extends the scope of the provision on unfair discrimination, but it also extends legal liability. And thirdly, it places additional duties on certain organizations, including NPOs. Who will be affected? Well, basically everybody. The Act, as it already stands, has very broad application. It applies to the state, but it also applies to every person. And a person is both a, a natural person, but it's also a juristic person. In other words, any uh, church, any religious institution, um, any um, organization that really has a, as a, a juridic, as, is a juridical entity. So it could be an independent faith-based school or normal school. It could be a, a non-profit organization. It really has very, very broad application. And so likewise, the bill will apply to everybody. You can see the individuals, religious organizations or institutions, ministries, even charities, even in Christian adoption agencies, um, preachers, pastors, counselors, therapists, psychologists, social workers, um, nonprofit organizations, businesses, independent faith by schools, the media, so literally everybody. Okay, let's zero in on each one of those things that the bill does. Firstly, I said it broadens the definitions of equality and unfair discrimination. How does it do this? In terms of the current act, um, equality is narrowly defined, but what this act does is it says equality, there shouldn't only be equality of outcome. In other words, recognizing that in our society, we do have people who almost get out of very different starting blocks and that ultimately we want to see some sense of equality um, in terms of what people are able to achieve. But it goes even further than that and says that everyone must have equal rights, equal opportunities to, to reach a certain finishing point. Um, so for instance, let, let's make it very practical. In the context of a, of a church or another organization, it would say that you cannot exclude or disqualify certain people from becoming a member of the church or an employee of the church or even a leader of the church or the organization. Everybody must have access to the same opportunities to the same resources, to the same, um, yes, opportunities for leadership, membership, uh, employment. And why this is important is because let's say a, ch a church, that's an easy example. A church would hold to certain doctrines and beliefs. For instance, um, while a church may welcome every person um, of whatever background to visit the church, to come to Sunday services, to communities, they may have certain qualifications for membership. And so, well, when you become a member of this church, you have to renounce Islam or the Hindu faith, or you, 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 you can no longer practice a homosexual lifestyle. You have to agree now, repent and agree with the doctrines of our church. And unless you, you do that, you cannot be a member of the church. You can be a visitor. Or likewise, the same with um, employment or being a leader of the church. Now, if we bring it home into the context of media organizations, say a Christian magazine or a Christian radio station, or um, a radio set or a, a TV channel that espouses a certain and promotes a certain religion. Basically, in terms of this definition of equality, you would not be able to place such conditions on either the people you employ um, to work for your particular radio station, TV station, or um, you know, whatever it might be, or to serve on, say, the board of directors or be in the leadership of the organization. Now, clearly, that would be very unfair and a great um, erosion of religious autonomy and religious freedom. Then also on the definition of unfair discrimination, Michael's already explained that in terms of a current act, unfair discrimination is where um, people don't get the same treatment. So 
on some people a burden is imposed that is that is not on other people or um, on the other hand benefits and opportunities are withheld from some people whereas other people have um, access to those benefits and opportunities but now what the amendment bill proposes is to stretch that definition of unfair discrimination even further and to say that merely causing someone prejudice or otherwise undermining their dignity that in itself can constitute unfair discrimination now that's where the issue becomes very subjective and therefore problematic because what what is the test for undermining dignity somebody can really say well that really hurt my feelings um i don't like it when you say that you you offend me when you say that and and how is that really tested we we have to go on these say so and then for that reason in itself because they say their dignity has been infringed that can now constitute unfair discrimination so if we had to bring it home to a practical example, um, if somebody, for instance, had to say, Marcus referred to the Chetty case, but let's say someone who works for a Christian radio station or on a TV channel were to say that Christianity is the only true religion and they were to be a non-believer or somebody else who were to watch this and, and listen to it and, and take offense, then immediately now they could use this amendment bill if it had to be passed into law and say, but you've unfairly discriminated against me because you undermine my dignity even though it didn't amount to withholding a benefit or imposing a burden, the mere fact that the dignity was undermined will now be unfair discrimination. And importantly, this will be the case even if the person who said, made that statement, did not intend to discriminate. Because the act very clearly, or the amendment bill very clearly writes into it that intention will play absolutely no role. The, the only question is, does someone feel that, that they've been prejudiced does someone feel that their dignity has been undermined and that will be enough to establish discrimination? So the effect of this is that these very broad and subjective definitions which are now proposed would move any defenses to a discrimination claim. Um, it's really, if that's what someone says, that's, that's what will apply. And remember that that media exemption clause that already applies in terms of the act, um, it would not grant immunity against such a claim because, again, the fact that someone says that they feel that their dignity has been impaired, that is enough to establish discrimination. So very dangerous. Then the second very concerning is aspect regarding this bill is the fact that the bill extends the scope, not only the, the definition itself, but the scope of the prohibition on unfair discrimination as well as legal liability. How does it do this? Well, it writes in a provision to say that any person who causes, encourages, or requests another person to discriminate against someone is deemed to have discriminated. So in other words, it's no longer only the person who actually discriminated who will be held liable in law, but also the person who is seen to have caused or encouraged or requested them to serve discriminated. So again, to make it practical, let's say there's a Christian radio station who broadcasts a traditional biblical teaching on marriage. If someone then acts on the basis of that teaching that they've heard on the radio station, let's say uh, a street preacher and he goes out and he preaches virtually the same message saying, you know, God created us male and female or um, the only marriage that is a valid marriage um, in the eyes of God is a marriage between a, a man and a, and a woman. And then somebody had to take offense, then it's not only that street preacher that would be held accountable, but, accountable, but if he had to in any way say, I heard that on the radio and that's what I believe too, um, then potentially there could be legal liability for, for the radio. Or you think if someone had to go out and on the back of what they've heard on radio or on TV or read in a magazine, write something on social media, then again, if they had to in any way point back to you, it, it could be said that you've caused them to write them or you've encouraged them by what you preached to have said that, then you yourselves could be held liable. So extremely, extremely dangerous. Then it also extends the scope of like legal liability um, to joint and several liability. What this means is that where an employee contravenes the act, discriminates either by their actions or what they've said, then both the employee and the employer will be held legally responsible unless the employer can show that they took reasonable steps to prevent the employee from contravening. So again, let's take an example. Let's say there's a, a journalist, a news reporter working for a Christian radio station um, and this person, the employee, makes a statement that a listener from another religion feels undermines his or her dignity. Now, it's the employee who made, made that, that statement, but the radio station could be held accountable, even if the radio station doesn't necessarily hold to the same position as its employee who made the statement, and even if the employee didn't intend to undermine dignity, to discriminate. 
So again, it extends the liability that could apply in terms of the act, and that is very dangerous. And again, the, the media exemption would not grant any immunity, like in you know, Survivor, where you can say, I have the I have the secret idol that grants me immunity. That would not help you because the question is still, is it fair? And because that becomes so subjective, particularly in view of the, the amended scope of the act, that may be very difficult to prove. Then the final issue that is of um, great concern is that the amendment bill imposes additional compliance duties virtually on everyone. All persons, and again, remember persons are natural persons, persons but also um, 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 entities that, that are juridical entities, um, non-governmental organizations, NPOs, community-based organizations, traditional institutions, um, including therefore religious and ministry organizations. And what it says is that you must promote equality in your relationships with other, other bodies and in public activities. In other words, the state now imposes a positive obligation on virtually everyone to promote equality and not just any form of equality or equality as you view it in your Christian or whatever worldview, but equality as the state sees it, equality as it is legislated in this bill. And who will be the minister who will be responsible for this? Well, it will be potentially the cocktail minister. Now, why is that an issue? Because the cocktail minister is the very minister at the moment who's in charge of our lockdown COVID regulations and who has imposed once again, irrational, very often we would say irrational and unfair um, and unjustifiable regulations, particularly when it comes to the religious space. Now, this will be the minister who, again, through regulations, will determine what this will look like for businesses, for organizations, for media organizations, for individuals when they have to promote equality, and will issue codes of practice that will determine how this needs to be done. So once again, very dangerous, we would say draconian, because what it does is it imposes a form of state regulation of religion on individuals, businesses, and organizations by imposing the state's view of equality and unfair discrimination on them and really allowing the state to interfere with institutional autonomy. In other words, to interfere with what your doctrine is concerning who should be members, who should be employees, who should be leaders, the internal workings of an organization. Um, so one might just well throw away your organis uh, organization's constitutions, which says this is what we believe. And because of those beliefs, these are the people that we will employ. These are the people we would put in leadership. And these are the kind of messages that we will be promoting through our magazine, on TV, and on radio. So it really amounts to a form of thought control. Um, I'm nearing the end, and then we're going to open it up for questions and um, your question and answer session. But what is the ideal outcome? The ideal outcome is that we would want this bill to be scrapped in its entirety. entirety. Similar to the Quilani case, where the hate speech provisions in the, um, in the current act already were found to be overbroad, we are saying that that what government is trying to do here is completely overbroad and therefore unconstitutional. It's really big brother interfering in literally every aspect of our lives and our private interactions. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to firstly make written submissions on this bill by the deadline of the 31st of June. And we need to rally as many members of the public, particularly also really religious organizations, religious leaders, but just individuals to send in their submissions and to object to this bill. Um, for us, I will be sending our own submission, but we've also prepared a template submission that is available on our, or, um, it will be loaded on our website, and people can use that either as is, or people can modify it and send it in. But again, um, if we can get 60,000 plus submissions to, to go in on this bill, similar to what we did with the hate speech bill, then we can really, um, we have good prospects of pushing back on, on this bill, which is potentially the most dangerous um, bill that, that we've seen to date in the context of religious freedom. We will also be requesting a high level meeting with the Minister of Justice to discuss the bill. Again, this is similar to what we did with the hate speech bill, where we convened a great number of religious leaders, um, got them together at, I think it was the Every Nation Hall in, um, in one city, and there were a few hundred of them, and they really gave the Minister of Justice a, a very hard time regarding the, the hate speech and hate crimes bill, and I don't think he was prepared for that, and it was also as a result of that that we managed to write in a religious exemption clause into the bill. Uh, another thing that we are proposing to religious leaders is to really make this a political or elections issue. Um, local elections are scheduled for the 27th of October, and we are saying that we need to make this a uh, determinative issue for the elections, because once the elections have come and gone, well, then whoever is 
whoever is in charge can really do what they want to, and we can be sure that this bill is, is likely to be, to be rammed through. And again, we are not saying, I want to be very clear, that we are not saying that it is the ANC who wants to impose these things on, on the public, on organizations. But the reality is that once this bill is in place, then whoever is in charge will have to, will have to apply this law and will be able to, to implement this law, both on individuals and organizations. And then finally, the press. We want to release press releases, um, potentially even convene a press conference with religious leaders. But this is where you as the media organizations can really help us, can really partner with us. And we are so grateful for the many of you who are already doing, doing that um, by publishing articles, by radio interviews, TV interviews, and so forth, because we need to get the word out. We can do the legal thinking and explain to people how this will affect them but you have the networks and this is where we really rely on you to get the word out, to get people to make their submissions, to mobilize the public so that we can really push back on this um, draconian bull. And then finally, just, yeah, we are a voluntary organization or we are a nonprofit organization. We are entirely dependent upon voluntary contributions from the public to enable us to do our work. Um, so yeah, for people who want to make a donation, members of the public, and that is our website. We do really do need all the support we can get to help us in fighting these battles, both in courts, before government, and before parliament. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for your time, for the attention. And if you have any questions, then by all means do that. Otherwise, just to say quickly, we have sent the slideshow of this in a PDF format. Uh, to um, Natalie, uh, she could distribute it to everybody in case you didn't catch everything that we said. I know it was a bit of a drink from a fire hydrant. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, also get onto our website. You can sign up for our newsletter on our www.forsa.org.za site. You can follow us on Facebook, Freedom of Religion SA. So thank you again so much for having us. And we trust this has been helpful to you. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Advocate Nadine and Michael for this presentation. I think it's opening our eyes. It's just getting me uh, on, on both sides. One as a pastor in the church, especially when we are talking about the, I think you, you were talking about the beloved boss case. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, some of us are marriage officers. What would happen if we are we are forced to conduct marriages that maybe it might be seen as, as hate or whatever, you know? And I think it's important for us, and you requested that the Christian media uh, to partner with you guys and mobilize the public and the church and encourage them to, to push back on this bill and submit our, uh, and give our submissions. And I would, I, I would say so as well, because if there could be changes like this, I'm not sure, where the freedom of religion will be and uh, where many of us will be. Uh, I guess we'll have to amend even the Bible, some of us. God did not create men and women. Those will be issues that we find ourselves in serious, serious challenges. Colleagues, I'm not sure if there are any questions. I see here, I liked what Link FM was saying that I wish there was a PVR function on this so that we can rewind and, and understand what is, what is happening. But if in the absence of none questions, uh, Michael, thank you for sending your slides and we will make sure that we circulate uh, the presentation to everybody. Uh, I guess most people, they know how to contact you in order to work out those partnerships and ensuring that they call you in. Uh, but um, if you can just give your, your email address, maybe you can drop it on the chat box um, for those who probably want to be in contact with you. And, and see how best they can work together with yourselves. That, that will be appreciated. Oh, I see Advocate Nadine has already dropped it. <laughs> thanks, 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 Advocate. Info at forsa.org.za. Uh, and also the website is there to see all the great work that they are doing. Thank you so much. I know you're doing more than just this. Um, you guys are doing exceptionally great work. Uh, we've, we've been in contact in many other work that you are doing. And it, it's so wonderful to see that you you really stand for the freedom of religion in South Africa. Um, Thank you. And if, if I could, if I could maybe just say as well, because we have all the wonderful uh, South African Christian media um, generals and leaders on this call, we 
are very interested and very open to giving interviews, to uh, making sure that you get our press releases. Please, if you want to send to info um, at forza.org.za, the email address that you're given, you can do that. You can write to us. You can get onto our website. We have a specific tab on our website uh, for media. If you want to interview us, if you want to invite us to speak at anything, then we're very, very willing and welcome to do so. Um, we believe it is so important to get this information out. I, I, I suspect that you learned something today, even if it was a bit of a, a blur of information <laughs> that you probably didn't know before. And I suspect that what you heard made you think, oh, my goodness, you know, is this where we're going? Is this even the country that we live in? But the answer is yes, it is. And unless we hold on to, unless we defend, unless we promote our religious freedom rights, we are in grave danger of losing them. So one mm. of the best ways is, of course, to keep informed. So please sign up for our newsletters as well if you're not already signed up. But we would be more than happy to work with you. Thank you for helping us to get this word out. We deeply appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much, Michael. I think more than anything else, as much as there was some legal jargon in the discussion, but it was truly an eye opener even to the media houses, especially when Advocate Nadine was talking, I think you were talking about section 6.3, where you said there's joint liability. If your employee says anything, you as a media house, you can't say it's those kind of things makes us now to say, Poof, we really need help. I see some comments saying media houses, we need help on this so that we can be clear and even inform our employees as to what does this mean if it comes to play. But we just trust God that it's not going to be as bad as, but I, I believe that us as, as the Christian media, as well as the church, uh, we need to strongly come up and oppose this as best as we can. And people like yourself are really doing a great work. So thank you so, so much and God bless you. Hey? Great. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we've come to the end of our session for uh, this hour. Uh, we're going to have a 30 minutes break now, and we will come back again at uh, 5 to 3 for the last session of the day. And we will be having, uh, once again, two speakers, Matt Bird and Claudine Raid, who will be talking to us about the spirit of enterprise. And we're looking forward to that. So thank you so much. If you want to remain in the breakaway room, you can do that, or you can log off and come back again. Uh, let's just have a quick comfort break. Then we will come back at 5 to 3. God bless you all. Hey. Maybe let me allow you, oh, Nate, uh, Natalie is taking us to the <laughs> breakout room. I just wanted to allow everyone to open their mics and just say hi, but we'll see that later. God bless. <laughs>